they are caring more about punching holes in the darkness than they are the my life is his i have committed my life to him to use me any way he pleases in order to make his name great that's suffering for jesus and he's saying that is what is the norm in this kingdom of what is it that makes you cry or happy or sad or miserable what is it that, 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 that every single one of these men were discouraged in their life but they did something that i want us okay welcome for those of you watching us online roku any of the places you found us if you would like to know more about our ministry you can go online to womensbiblestudy.com and that's where you'll know everything you want to know about us so today, uh, welcome. We are on series, a series, our discouraged series. We are in lesson seven. Today we are going to talk about Job and we are going to talk about suffering, okay? But first, I want to say, uh, wh what did you think of Lynn last week, okay? <laughs> Woo! Well, she's so awesome. Okay, for those of you watching us on Roku, I told you that we were going to save lessons parts two and three for the summer and everyone there was this big uproar like no we want to watch it now so uh, I think two is on there now David should have three if we don't already have it on it'll be on so for you Roku watchers uh, it's it should be up so that's that's a good thing okay she was telling me a story on the way to the airport and it, it just she, she her being here was so good for me because it made me really just get this great view of God I think we live in the United States and you know it's kind of like you read your Bible in the morning but she opened up this whole world. She has this great, great uh, um, passion and love for Jesus. And she has this great relationship with him. And she was telling me this story on the way to the airport. And she said, Lisa, she said, one time, she said, God woke me up in the middle of the night. This was when Sam was in Africa and the LRA was really, really going strong. And they, they had just attacked a village. And she said, she woke up in the middle of the night and God said, I need you to pray for Sam right now. So she gets on her knees and she's like, God, you know, I'm keep him safe, whatever's going on, she had no idea. Next morning, Sam called her and he said, you're not going to believe what happened. He said, the LRA, they, they bombed this whole village. And she, he said, we had to get into this village. And he said, so we took our car and we drove. And all the LRA are on the sides of the road and they're walking with our guns. And he said, not one of them looked up and even saw that we were driving through into the village. And so it was just that whole prayer covering that, and she's just all about prayer. It's the coolest thing. She just, she just it took my faith level. And, so I know I need to like pray more and all of those things. Okay, Cheyenne told, or someone told Cheyenne the other day that, uh, I think I told you this, Eminem should sponsor our Bible study because apparently I talk about M&Ms all the time. There you go, okay? So Vicki sent, sent me this. It's literally the funniest thing I've ever seen. She's on the scale and he says, these are Weight Watcher diet, these aren't Weight Watcher diet pills. You've been reading them upside down. <laughs> I like laughed hysterically. That was the cutest thing I've ever seen. And I'm like, that is why I can't lose any weight because I thought I was on Weight Watcher diet pills. <laughs> <laughs> that was so cute. Um, and then, then someone put this on Facebook too, and um, I read it to my husband. Exercise block. Place block on the floor, walk around it twice, sit down and relax. You have just walked around the block twice. <laughs> I said, that is my kind of exercising. Although our treadmill broke, that would be super sad, except for the fact that that just meant I didn't have to walk on it. So yesterday, we had to get a new one. So there it is, sitting, staring at me every morning. So it's time to do something. It could not fit into anything. Last week, Lynn, all she wanted to do was go to Jamba Juice, okay? Like twice a day. I'm like, do you know how many calories are in Jamba Juice? Nope, but I had to eat it with her. So there you go, drink it. All right, um, we're very sad that Lynn has left, but now we are going to talk about our next guest speaker, okay? She will be here when? November 5th, I think it is. Her name is Kristen Taylor. I found Kristen through Max Licato's book. I, I think his book was called You'll Get Through It, or You'll Get Through This. And her story was so amazing to me that I literally called Max Licato's church, talked to the secretary, and said, this girl goes to your church, and I need you to find her, and I need you to have her call me, okay? And she did. And so that's how we got connected. And we've been trying to get her. So I want to read her story real quick because some of you are new and you don't know anything about her. And uh, where it says, here's part of her story. We'll just read that real quick. She says, multiple hospital stays with my daughter were exhausting, but I held faith. Losing Brian's family members one by one until there was only one left who was then diagnosed with stage four brain cancer was incomprehensible, but I still held faith. 
Being hospitalized seven and a half weeks with a placental abruption was terrifying, but I held faith. I held to the faith that God works for my good. Though I did not necessarily understand the trials, I trusted God's bigger unseen plan. God and I had a deal. I would endure the trials that came my way as long as he acknowledged my stopping point. He knew where my line had been drawn, and I knew in my heart he would never cross it. But he did. I delivered a stillborn baby girl. With, the daughter, with my daughter Rebecca still at home on a feeding tube and her future health completely unknown, it was a foregone conclusion that this, was, this baby we so wanted and loved would be saved. But she wasn't. My line in the sand was crossed. My one-way deal with God was shattered. Okay? So she is going to be our guest speaker. She has the most amazing heart. She has the most amazing story about suffering and what it takes to go through suffering and, and suffer well. Because I think that's really the, the issue. And so our plan is going to ha be to have her here on November 5th. Now, last, we were supposed to have her in May. Um, her daughter ended up getting really, really sick. She's in the hospital so much with her daughter. I think her, I don't know how old her daughter is now, maybe 11 or something. She's in the hospital in now, mostly in the hospital for the last probably four years. Kristen stays in the hospital with her. Uh, last May, when we were supposed to have her here, she had a problem with, they needed to put new stents in. They couldn't get the stents to work. It, this was just a nightmare, just over and over. And um, so finally, they got the stents to work. She couldn't come with, she couldn't come here because of that. The stents worked. It was supposed to work for a year. She ended up being able to go on vacation, and they had a really good summer until August hit. Once August hit, uh, she got sick again, and back. she's now been back in the hospital for six weeks. So it's really up in the air whether she, she's going to be here or not. But um, I, I put that on, your, on the table right there, so hopefully you can take that home with you, stick it in your Bible, pray for them, and because uh, I really, really want her to be here. But more than that, I want Rebecca to get better. Now, today we're going to talk about discouragement. We're going to talk about suffering. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do when I put a lesson together. Um, I usually start on Thursday. I work Thursday and Friday. Um, by, by Friday, I have it pretty well figured out. By Monday, I put everything together. By Tuesday, I go over it a couple times, and so it's, it's a whole big process. Last Wednesday, after Thursday after Lynn left, I, I was completely exhausted, okay? I just said, I, I came home and I said, Rob, I gotta do my lesson. And he said, oh, no, 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 you're not doing that. You're gonna go to bed, okay? So I need you to rest. So I took our, our advice from Elijah, what we learned about in our series here, and I just rested the whole day, but it kind of threw me off, okay? So finally, I had, when I get a lesson, I always had this piece at the very end. Like on Monday, I know this is what God wants me to say, okay? As of last night at 10 o'clock, I had no peace. I, I can't even tell you why. I couldn't figure it out. I was frustrated. I changed the lesson over and over and over. I was copying last night at 10 o'clock at night. I couldn't sleep. I woke up at 3.30 this morning. I mean, this just went on and on all day. I woke up, and Lynn, Lynn Childers texts me this morning. She says, hey, hope you have a good study. She says, cheer on, girlfriend. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, would you knock off the cheerleader stuff, okay? Um, but I wrote her back, and I said, I don't have any peace about this morning, and like, I have to do this in two hours. So I, I walked into the house, and I, and I told Rob, I said, I feel like God has disappeared. I feel like he's not giving me a peace or letting me know that what I'm about ready to say is, is good. So I walked in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, it was this Holy Spirit moment, and God God just, this is what he said to me, you have no peace because what you're going to teach you've never been through, okay? And I want you to really understand that, that when I'm teaching this this morning, it comes from a place I've never been, and I feel so unqualified to teach that. And so when I'm teaching this morning, I want you to understand that, that, that I'm doing it out of, um, just because it's in the scripture, but I can't feel what Job feels. I can't feel what Kristen feels because honestly, that little whole pom pom cheerleader thing, I was thinking about that this morning and I think I do have that kind of life. Like, I had good parents. I didn't have issues. I have a great husband. Like, yes, we struggled, but things are great. I have great kids. So I feel like in my life, I've never gone through what we're going to talk about today. And so I feel like I'm up here and I've had a kindergarten degree, but I'm getting ready to teach a college course on like geometry. Okay. So know that going into it. Once I 
realized the problem, I said, okay, God, here's the deal. I'm going to teach this. I'm going to tell people where I'm coming from, and you're going to have to fill in the blanks to wherever everyone else is in life. So that's, that's where I have been. So hopefully, if you're suffering and going through a lot, this lesson will encourage you. If you come from a background where you have never really suffered yet, okay, it may be coming. And I know that in my own life. And I want to be prepared for when it comes. So this is going to be hopefully an encouragement for those suffering and a preparation for those of us that this may end up in our life at some point. So, all right. Kristen has written a bunch of blogs, and they are so good that what I want to do today is I want to start and read a couple of her blogs because it's going to go into this understanding about suffering. Okay, you've read her story. You understand that she comes from a vantage point of suffering in her life. So it's in your handout. We're just going to read some of this, and then we're going to go off on that today. Um, here's where she starts. Rebecca is still in ICU. This was just a couple weeks ago. Recovering from her pancreatic surgery back in a serious state of post-off pancreatitis. Historically, an enzyme elevation of this magnitude equates to the rejection of her stents. If the, re if her, if the reje uh, rejects her stents, this would lead to another surgery she would be incapable of enduring without the aid of steroids. The steroids would again ravage Rebecca's pancreas to create the situation we have now found ourselves in, a vicious, unending cycle. All medical professionals are in agreement that Rebecca's damaged pancreas needs to be removed, but all said medical professionals fear whether my child can live through the necessary transplant in her current state, especially with an unknown systemic disease. Early this morning, I was reading the Bible about a man named Naaman. Sleep was impossible, so I resorted to, a, to second kings in a last-ditch effort, thinking stories of unfaithful monarchs, idolatry, and gory battles would bring my mind peace. She says, don't judge, I'm quite delirious these days. I discovered that Naaman was a pagan with leprosy. He was a commander of the army of the king of Aram who worshipped a god named Rimen. Naaman suffered from a debilitating disease with no cure yet. Though through his God-fearing Israelite slave, Naaman found healing. He encountered the prophet Elisha who gave him instructions to cure his affliction and Naaman's flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. But as incredible as Naaman's restorative health was, the true miracle came straight from the very disease he pleaded to be rid of. It was because of Naaman's agony and because of his unknown affliction that he uttered the words, Now I know there is no God in all the world except Israel. Through his physical ailment, Naaman's soul found its home. There is no doubt that our Lord uses suffering throughout the Bible to reveal himself. For just as the heathen Naaman found his maker through leprosy, and Christ's power was unveiled through the man born blind, and the death of Stephen began an unstoppable evangelical movement. God is performing wonders through Rebecca Elizabeth Taylor's disease. I know it, I feel it, and I experience it. Now, that might be a really good word for somebody this morning, because here's what I'm learning about, about Job and Kristen and all the other people we're going to talk about this morning, is that many times God is seen best through suffering. Okay? And I don't like that. I don't want to suffer. But I know that when I do, like you know, I, I, someone said this morning, well, you lost all your money. And I said, well, money's whatever. You know? I mean, if that's the worst that ever happens to me, then, then whatever. But it's not, it, it, that's not, I don't know that that's really suffering. You know what I'm saying? But I know that just what small little portion that did in my life, it grew my faith and it made me trust God more. And I think people who suffer, that's what happens. You, you, you tend to turn your eyes on, upon Jesus and now he's your only source of, of what you need. Now, Andy Stanley, I told you last week, Andy Stanley has a series called In the Meantime. What I didn't tell you online was how to get to that series. If you go to meantimeseries.org, okay, Th this, it's called In the Meantime, but he does a series really cool. Like, he's, like if you want to watch followseries.org, that's on there. He calls this one meantimeseries.org. Go to it. It's probably one of the best series I've ever heard in my life, okay? But in there, he said something that I never thought of before. He said the people in the Bible, the people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they, they just thought suffering was normal. Okay, now we don't get that in the United States because if, if I start suffering, I'm like, God, what's wrong? What did I do? You're mad at me. We have all of those thoughts here in America. But think about it. In the Bible, suffering was just something that they just, that was just the norm for them. They didn't know any different. And their suffering just drew them closer to God and showed people around them what God was like. Think about it. James, James Peter, James, John. 
closest disciple of, of Jesus. And he's the first martyr, okay? So he gets martyred, he gets murdered, and you don't see any of the disciples going, oh, why would God let that happen? Okay, they just knew we're going to just keep going, okay? Th that was normal to them. And I think if we start looking at life differently, like maybe suffering is normal, okay? And we might have to change our perspective a little. John the Baptist, he's beheaded. Jesus' cousin for crying out loud. And no one seemed to say, were you mad at John the Baptist? What's wrong? How come? No one did that. They just knew that was part of following Jesus. Uh, we look at Stephen, he was stoned to death. Paul, he was most likely beheaded. Peter, crucified upside down. And see, we never heard, that's not fair, God. What are you thinking? Why would you do that to me? Okay, and, and when I realized that, I thought, you know what? They never equated suffering with God's love for them or God's lack of love for them. And that was really important for me to learn this week. And that's something we need to think about in case you are suffering or in case you're going to go into a suffering stage. When that happens, be prepared and say, you know what? My suffering does not equate with God's love for me or his non-love for me, okay? It, it doesn't work that way. So once we get that, I think, I think it will help us. But this is what we learn from the Bible, that how Christians respond to their suffering is what other people look at. When we look at Kristen Taylor and I see how she responds to suffering, I'm like, I want to be like her. And people say, I, wanna, I want the Jesus that you have because I understand that, that that's not normal. It's not normal for you to smile. It's not normal for little Rebecca to tell the doctors all about Jesus. And she's so sick, okay? It's not normal. But suffering does that if we learn to suffer right. James uh, 1 says this in the Bible. Andy Stanley said the coolest thing the other day, too. Uh, apparently, I have an obsession with Andy Stanley and this teaching. I just, I, I, he's one, you know how you find people that just, you click with, like, you like, you know, some of my kids will be like, hey, mom, did you read this book from this author? And I'll be like, I don't get him, okay? But I get Andy Stanley for some reason. But he said something about, he says, James was written by the brother of Jesus, which means you have holding in your hand, when you read the book of James, you have the words of the guy who lived with Jesus all of his life. I mean, that's some pretty good stuff, okay? But James 1 says this, Consider it all joy, by my brethren, when you encounter various trials. When. He doesn't say if. He doesn't say hope you don't. He doesn't say that. He said you and I living in this world are going to experience trials. And then he says, Knowing that the testing of your faith produces our endurance. Because when our faith is tested, we have a choice. We can say, I quit. I give up. I'm not doing this God thing anymore. Jesus just didn't perform the way he's supposed to perform for me. Or with each test of our faith, we can cling to Jesus. We can say, what do you want me to learn? How, how can I uh, show other people you? That we have the option to do e either one of those. And the one that is going to produce endurance is the one that people are going to look at our life and say, I want what you have. Because because endurance is what people are attracted to. So Dusty, um, when he, he plays for high school, but he gets really nervous for some reason. I don't know what it is. And so he went to the coach the other day, and he said, um, he, he said, I don't know what's wrong with me. And, and the coach said, well, what do you want this year? And he said, well, my heart is to play varsity, but, if I, but I really want to play down and play JV too so I can play more. And this is what the coach said. Well, as it stands right now, you're on the very tail end of even making the team at all. Yeah. And Dusty was just like, what? <laughs> okay. Now, here's his choices. I'm never playing basketball again. He sat down with Rob and he said, Dad, it just makes me never want to play. And Rob said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you just quit right now, what are all the people watching you going to say? He's a quitter. But what if you actually work really hard and you go prove to that coach that you can actually play, okay? And you, you practice more, okay? People look at those that endure. They don't, they don't ever remember the people that walk away. How many people do you know in your, that, that became Christians, something bad happened, they walked away from their faith, and they're nowhere to be found. And you're just like, I don't know what happened to them. But what about the people in your life that you know, they've been through so much. We have a lady here that I can't, she's my Job, I always say. She's been through more in her life, and, and she's still sitting here. I don't get that, you know what I mean? But, but it's, just, it's just this feeling 
God, I'm hanging on to you through it all. I think we just have to change our perspective on life. Because here's the question. Do you think people would be more apt to believe in Jesus if God just answered all your prayers? Like you prayed for your son to, you know, to, to get off drugs on Monday and Tuesday he got off drugs, or you prayed for a job on Wednesday and you got one on Thursday, or you prayed for your marriage to be better and your husband brought you roses on Friday? Like would they want, to want that God? I mean, they might for a minute because that God says, I'm a genie in a bottle. And I'm just here to just be at your, your wish, you know, back and call. But, but the Jesus of the Bible isn't like that. And, and, and I think that people are more apt to believe in a God that watches your life and my life as we persevere through all the things in our life. And they, say, they see us saying, I don't know why I'm going through this. And I don't even like what I'm going through. But I love Jesus and I know he has a purpose. And so I'm always going to follow him regardless of what happens. That is very um, what, what, attracting to, to somebody who isn't a believer in Jesus at all. I, I have, I, last week I told you we were going to, uh, to get our pedicure done after with Lynn. She likes pedicures. So I went to our little, our, my, the place I always go, and there's this one sweet little girl. I've told you about her a long time ago. She was raised a Buddhist. She's Vietnamese. She, um, one of her the customers invited her to church. Now, when you go and invite somebody like your nail person or your toe person or whatever, this is what they always say. Oh, no, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. I have to work. Okay. And she said, so she did that to her a long time. Finally, one day she said, I'll go with you. And she went and she got saved. And then she took her husband and her husband got saved. But it wasn't just this, I'm saved. It was this radical, she just wants everyone in the nail salon to come to Jesus. So she's inviting them to church, okay? And she, so we went there, and she was really down. And I was so sad. I said, what's going on? And she said, I, I keep inviting people. And they come because they want something from Jesus. One guy wants his wife to get pregnant. So he comes to church. Jesus, help my wife to get pregnant. When she doesn't get pregnant, he said, I'm not believing in this Jesus anymore. Okay? And she said, I don't understand why people don't understand what this is all about. You know? But she's persevering. But, but most people want this God that just answers their prayers all the time. And that's not the God of the Bible. And we've got to really, really understand that. Um, now, some days, for some of you, I know that you get really tired. If you're in the midst of the suffering, you're just kind of done with the whole thing. And, and, and some days are like that even for Kristen. So I want to read the next part to one of her blogs because we're human beings and we have emotions and sometimes your suffering gets so overwhelming that you just want to be done. And she hit one of those moments a couple weeks ago. She says, there are moments like today I'm not strong enough to want what is best for God's bigger plan. I want my boys to have a mother who buy their, buys their school supplies, drops them off for the first day of school, and tucks them in at night, but God knows that. I want to sleep in the same bed with my husband and have a conversation that does not include a life-altering decision, but God knows that. I want a life that exists outside of the confines of this claustrophobic hospital room, but God knows that. I want Rebecca's disease to be defined and then eradicated, but God knows that. And more than anything at this particular moment, I want my daughter out of pain, but God knows that. So if my Lord intimately knows what my desires are and yet still allows Rebecca's affliction to rage on, then I have to learn to accept the unseen. My situation may not make sense, but it doesn't have to. And I love that about her, her honesty, because, and some of you are just there. I've prayed, I've prayed, I've begged, I've pleaded, I've asked God. He knows what I want. He's not doing what I'm asking. I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do. And this is what she says. The creator of the universe does not need my approval before he uses my daughter's illness to reveal his glory. Now put your situation in that. The creator of the universe does not need my approval before he uses my really crappy marriage, my child who's wayward, my lack of job, my lack of finances. He doesn't need our permission. He just needs us to say, God, use me however you want to use me. He said, and he is using her, not just in the doctors, nurses, teachers, neighbors, friends, and families' lives that are surrounding her, but he is using this trial to transform my life as well. Rebecca's journey gives me great patience. It affords me eternal perspective. It provides unyielding hope, a bleeding heart of compassion, a crazy dose of empathy and supernatural love. And for the first time in my life, through this suffering, I'm afforded an intimate glimpse into my Savior's hand. Whether I like it or not, 
the works of God are being displayed through Rebecca's disease so that everyone who knows her will not hesitate to utter the words that Naaman did. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. In Israel. And see, I just want to encourage those of you because I want us to walk out of here today with a whole new perspective on life and a whole new perspective on suffering and what you're going through. And because I, th I think we need to remember God doesn't need our permission. He just needs our availability. He just needs us to say, God, I am in this situation I don't like and I don't like what's happening, but here I am, God. Use me however you want me to use, use me because I want other people to see you, okay? And our suffering can be used to point people to Jesus. And sometimes it's in the hospital room. Sometimes it's in a difficult marriage, a principal's office at your school, at your kid's school, the rehab center, the courtroom. I mean, you name it. God has us at different places in our life because he wants to use us. But the thing is that we have to say, I give. Okay. And, and that's always a choice that we have because now, because Kristen doesn't venture out of the hospital very much, um, she, she actually teaches a Bible study in, in Texas, and she teaches mostly on the life of Job, which makes total sense. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, they asked her to come and teach, and she, she never leaves Rebecca, but she decided to do this for this one night. And this is what she writes. The topic of my lesson is eerily prophetic to my role as a mother these days. Are we willing to go where God calls us? Something that struck me the past few years, though, is the fact that people's testimonies are given all the time powerful, inspiring stories. But what struck me was most are spoken in past tense. What has happened and what was overcome? The recovered alcoholic, the freed slave, the now wealthy but once poor businessman, the cancer survivor. These testimonials are a phenomenal reminder of our Lord's redemptive powers. But in my new normal of life, I find much less frequent stories being told in the middle of the suffering, in the epicenter of unquenchable pain. And some of you get that. But what if, and by that I mean me, knew deep down that God could use us or me right in the center of our trial? Like, what if we actually changed our whole life and said, God, I want you to use me in the middle of what I'm going through right now? What if we, she says me, could grasp that concept in the circle of our tribulations, that we could truly feel God creating something beautiful during our ugly and not just after our crazy has come and gone? When Rebecca was diagnosed four years ago, I remember contemplating waiting. I thought this was a great point. Waiting until Rebecca was well enough to take such a large commitment of teaching. Waiting until I recovered from losing Annabelle. Waiting until I no longer lived in the hospital. Waiting until my boys had more stability. Waiting on life. And I really thought about that. Waiting would be easier and under the circumstances, waiting would be fully acceptable. But sometimes we are called to walk the road less traveled. Sometimes we are called to a life that is anything but easy anything but acceptable. I would, I would have waited four plus years for Rebecca to be healed while wasting four plus years of our sharing my intimate walk with God during my intimate time of anguish. Van Gogh's most brilliant paintings came from the crater of depression. C.S. Lewis's most inspirational writings came from the center of great grief. Gustav Mahler's most melodic symphony came from his coping of his terminal illness. John Nash's most intellectual theories came from the middle of mental illness. What if our greatest accomplishments, our great works, our greatest abilities were only accessed during our trials? Because I will tell you this, trials are what grows us up spiritually. And if we can change our perspective and when something happens in our life, not go, God, why are you doing this to me? I don't need this right now. Don't you understand I'm busy? Don't you, like, I don't need this. I always say that, some people, someone said, or someone said, I heard Ebola was in the United States. And I'm just like, you know, wh whatever. I guess if I get it, I get it. But I'm just not going to worry about it, okay? Because I know God's in control. But it's kind of this, this point of saying, whatever God gives me, I know I'm going to be okay. Okay, because I'm trusting him with my life. And when you and I become followers of Jesus, that's what we've done. We said, God, my life is yours. Now do with me whatever you need to do so I can be a light to other people. Some people have tougher lives than others. Kristen spends most of her life in the hospital, okay? And I don't even know how to make that any better. So today I want to talk about a man by the name of Job. Um, and before we get into Job, I want to talk about something about motion sickness. And I, I call it spiritual motion sickness because I think the problem is when we see people suffer, we have what I call spiritual motion sickness. And this is where I learned this. 
Many years ago, my brother flew helicopters, okay? He loved to fly. So he asked Rob and I one day, do you want to go on a helicopter ride? I said, sure. So we get in, and this is what he says. I don't even know what those things are called. Rotors, rotor, whatever those things are at the top that go around. He said, when I got in, he said, do not look up at those things, whatever they're called. He said, if you do, you'll get immensely sick. Now, that's like saying, okay, there's some wet paint, don't touch it. Because I'm like, okay, that's stupid. Okay, look up and see it. And I'm telling you what, don't ever do that in a helicopter, right? I was so incredibly sick and I decided I'm never riding in a helicopter again, okay? So Rob and I went to Alaska a few years later and he loves helicopters. So he's like, let's go on a helicopter ride. And I was like, <coughs> just the thought of it made me sick. So I said, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to like focus on the back seat. I'm just not going to look and... So we take off, and everything is fine until a helicopter pilot sees a moose. Okay, now we're in the middle of Alaska, this big monster moose. And so he takes a helicopter, and he's like, oh, a moose, okay. Okay, on its side and over, and I'm just like, Ugh. And so I, they, we had like little headphone things. And after he did that, I'm, I'm like literally going to throw up. And I said, Rob, you have one minute to get this helicopter on the ground because I'm going to throw up all over the back seat, and he's not going to be very happy, so get me on the ground. So... He lands the, the helicopter, and I got out, and I said, I'm walking back. <laughs> now, we're in the middle of nowhere, okay? I don't even know where walking back means, but I'm never getting back in that helicopter again, okay? But here's what I learned about motion sickness. I put it in your um, handout. Motion sickness is the feeling you get when the motion you sense with your inner ear is different from the motion you visualize. It's common that occurs in people who travel by car, plane, airplane, train, airplane. <laughs> or a boat and helicopter, okay? They should have added that into it. Um, but here's the deal is we have this conflict between what we see and what maybe someone has told us or what we've heard. A and that we, that in that way, if we don't get that right, we can get, and I call it spiritual motion sickness because a lot of us perceive something about God, especially when it comes to suffering. God would never do that. God would never allow me to suffer. And we perceive something, and then when it happens, we have spiritual motion sickness because what we see that's it, happening and what we've heard don't mesh together. And then we become kind of miserable, and we just, we're just spiritually just all all totally out of whack. Now, here was our, my choice, and it's going to be your choice too. My choice was to get back in the a helicopter, uh, try to figure out where I should focus so that I could, you know, enjoy the rest of the ride um, so I wouldn't get sick, or I stay outside the helicopter, I walk home, and I get eaten by a bear, okay? Because that's exactly what would have happened, okay? We're in the middle of, of wherever. But I had to really, and that's going to be always our choice too, and we get discouraged in life when we start seeing we, our, our, what we believe to be true about God and what is really honestly happening. When they don't mesh together, then it kind of messes us up spiritually. Now, a lot of times we have a perspective like this. My perspective on life is, if I'm nice to people, they're going to be nice to me. Okay, now that's, that's that whole, I see something, but that, and that's not true. Um, if we work hard, we're going to get a raise and they'll, they'll never fire me. Okay, we know that's not true. If we work, we love our spouse, they're going to always want to stay with us. Well, we know that's not true. Um, if we're good people, then good will always follow us. Okay, we know that's probably not true. And this is the where I want to land today. And this is where a lot of people get motion, uh, spiritually motion sick. When something bad happens, okay, um, here's what I perceive. I perceive that because I go to church, I teach a Bible study, I pray, uh, I would say I fast, but not really because I like to eat too much, um, help the homeless. Okay, so, so because I do those things, nothing bad will ever happen in my life. I just, I just assume that, okay? A and, and that's what happens. Here's an example. I'm on vacation this summer. And I told you that when we were gone for those seven days, I didn't really read my Bible. I didn't really pray. I didn't really care about anyone's salvation. I just kind of wanted to drink hot chocolate and go bike riding and uh, eat. Okay, that was what I wanted to do. Didn't care about any, anything spiritual at all. We come home. I told you I went to the cabin. Rob went to China. Um, we went to the cabin, and it was very, um, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. And so it was could be kind of scary. No one was around. My parents have a place. My brother has a place. No one was there but me and my three dogs. Rob's in China. So Erin calls me and she said, hey, how's it going up there? Are you scared for your first night? 
And I said, well, it's not dark yet, but I might be scared when it gets dark. And she said, well, let's just pray that a big angel guards your cabin. And I started laughing. And I said, I'm pretty sure that God would laugh if I asked him for that, okay? He'd say, really, Lisa? Like, who are you? Like, you just spent seven days and never even thought about me. Sorry, all angels are busy, okay? <laughs> I, I'm not, you know, and, and, but with that thought, I was, I was spiritually motion sick, okay? Because I believed something that wasn't true. I believe that God only loves me when I do something spiritual. Like, he doesn't love me if I don't. Like, he's not going to love me if I don't read my Bible. And that's not true. Here's the truth. God loves me regardless if I never read my Bible again, okay? But do you see what happens? We get this spiritual motion sickness when, when, when we, we don't, when we're believing something that isn't true. Job 42.5, I had heard of you only by the hearing of the ear, but now my spiritual eyes see you. So we want to get to the point in our life where everything we see is through our spiritual eyes, okay? We don't want to hear things. We want to just believe in what God is saying um, right in front of us. And we hear that from the word of God. Let's start with Job 1.3 to learn about 1.1 for Job. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, many servants, and the man was great, the greatest of all the men in the east. Okay, so here's Job. We would assume he's blameless, upright, fearing God, turning from evil. And not only that, he was really rich, okay? And we would assume, if we were assuming things, that God is blessing him because he's righteous, okay? But in reality, when you read the Bible, that's not true, okay? And God has his prerogative to do whatever he wants to do. And this is what we have to learn about what happened with Job in verse 6. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been controlling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God, stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you can test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with him, um, every, and with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Now, if you are new to Bible and you just read that verse, you probably want to walk away because you're like, I don't want to believe in a God like that. And I, I totally get that because it, it, that frustrates me. You're like, really, God? You're having this contest with Satan and you're going to use somebody's life? That, that's just, that's insanity, okay? Um, it just doesn't even make any sense. But I want us to take it a step further and think of the other side of the coin. If, in fact, that's true, okay, that, that God allowed for Satan to, to uh, do whatever he did to Job, then, then what that says to you and me in our life is that nothing ever happens to us that God isn't in control. That is really good news for us, okay? So you're sitting here and you're saying, but I'm going through, the, where's God, okay? He's allowing it to happen in your life. And some people don't like that. And I'm going to probably get a lot of emails because I believe God causes or allows things to happen in our life. He has to. If he doesn't, he's not God. And if he doesn't, then I don't, this world is just random. And I can't live like that, okay? So the Bible says, and if the Bible's true, which I believe it is, and this scene in Job is in here, it tells me one thing. Whatever you're going through and whatever I'm going through, God knows exactly what's going on, okay? And he's put it in your life or allowed it in your life for a purpose. Now, in one day, Job's entire world comes apart, and I want to do this kind of modern day, okay? Because we look back and we see servants, which we don't have, and we see, like, you know, camels, and none of us have that. But, but let's look at, look at this on, on the screen. Let's just say well, this is going to be a fictitious story about our life, okay? So Rob and I love God. We really love God, and that's really the truth. Uh, we teach Bible. That's true. We have our own business in China. Okay, that's true. Um, but we're really wealthy, and that's not true, okay? So, so that, that's where the story kind of goes fictitious on us, okay? Now, because we're really wealthy we're in our pretend story, we have a beach house. And 
and we'll show you our beach house. There's our beach house, isn't it pretty? Uh, it's right on the water. It's really awesome. So excited to take all my kids on vacation there. It's big enough because we have a really big family. Uh, now, so we decided we're going to go on vacation, okay? So we decide that uh, we're going to take all of our kids, and this is going to be our mode of transportation. Because we're so rich, we have a plane, okay? Now we have a plane in that car right there. That's not, you can't see it, but it's a big old limo. And so what we're going to do is we're, we told, we're going to tell the kids, hey, the limo is going to pick you up, and we're going to go on the vacation to our beach home, okay? Now, here's a picture of our family. I was going to try to find a picture of just anyone's family, but I realized we have a big family. So this kind of plays right into the whole story. So we have, uh, there's to, uh, actually... Oh, seven kids, five are married, so there's 12 kids in that. Job had 10, so you kind of get the point there. But the, the whole thing is, is that let's just say we said today, kids, oh, the limo's going to pick you up. They're going to take you to the airplane. We're going to the beach house. Rob and I, because of course we're so spiritual, we're teaching Bible and we're just going to catch the you know, d Southwest flight and we'll, we'll be there tonight. So we get on a they get, go get on a plane and we teach Bible and as I'm walking out, the police are there. And they say, I hate to tell you and be the bearer of bad news, but your plane went down and your whole family's gone, okay? I can't even imagine, imagine what Job or his wife felt like. That is the most tragic thing I could ever hear in my life. As he tells me that, I hear a news flash on the, on the TV out here at Rio, and it says, tsunami just hit my beach house, okay? Now, and it shows a picture, beach house completely obliterated by, by, my, by the storm, okay? It's not there anymore. Then, a few seconds later, I look on the news, and there's this big thing that says, worldwide news just happened. Russia just took over China, okay? And I'm like, well, Russians aren't going to let me have my business in China any longer. So now in one, see, if you put it in perspective, like it, it makes, like, Job, we go, oh, yeah, whatever, you know. But if you really put it in, the, in today's, uh, you know, with our fictitious story, the question is, how would you feel? How would I feel? I would be furious with God. I just would. I, I wouldn't want to be, but I know I would be, okay? And so many people get all bent out of shape because Job's wife was really upset. She's, this is what she said, curse God and die. Well, I, you know, I might feel the same way if, if that happened. But how, I think our questions would be, God, how could you do that to us? Like, we're good people. We love you. We teach your word. How could you do that to us? But the good thing about what we learn from Job is that everything that happens in our life, God has his hand in. And there is something so comforting about that. Now, we have a choice. Joyce, uh, his wife said to curse God and die, and, and a lot of people do that. We know a lot of people who things didn't go their way, they walked away from God. They said, I'm done with him. This is not the kind of God I want to believe in. And you never see them anymore in, 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 in their faith. But here's what Job did in verse um, 20. Whatever. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. Okay, there's a lot of grief going on. He shaved his head, fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. And all this Job did not sin. And I'll tell you what, I love Job because of, I don't think I would respond like that. Like, honestly, if my air conditioning goes out in, in the summer, I'm like, really, God? You've got to be kidding. Do you not understand that I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's 120,000 degrees outside? It's hot. Why would you do that to me? Okay? If I get in my bathtub at night, there's no hot water, you would think the whole world just came to end. I'd be like, really, God? Do you not know I need a bath? Okay, I need my two baths a day. Okay, that's just the way it is. But see what I'm saying? And the problem is, is that the questions that we have and what Job probably has is, why? God, why in the world are you doing this to me? And, and this is what happens. I think this side of heaven, most of your why questions and my questions will never be answered. But what we got to realize is who is behind everything. And, and, and that's why we have to learn that it's God that is behind everything. We have no time. I'm going to have to just go really, really far ahead. Um, uh, Job's friends come to him. They start telling him all about, you know, why they think that he's got all these bad things happening to him. He's telling him, uh, you know, you're, you must be sinful, Job. You must be having like a porn addiction on the side or you must be like, a, you know, having an affair on your wife. And Job's just like, I'm not doing any of those things, okay? And then his friends come along and they're like, you know, maybe you're just self-righteous. You just think it's all about you. And Job's like, I don't think that's it either. And, and so his friends are giving him false um, false ideas. And, and when Lynn was here last week, she spoke at the college group the night, that night. 
and Dusty went, and we said to him, Rob said to him the next day, what did you learn? He said, I learned how important friends are. And, and that's the one thing that, that Job needed to learn, is that what, what your friends tell you make a really big impression on your life. And for Job, they were telling him all things that were false. And so if you have problems in your marriage or with kids or you have issues in your life, find someone who knows the word. It's really important. Don't find someone who's just going to go along and say, yeah, your husband's an idiot. Yeah, you need to dump him. And yeah, you find someone who will say, let me pray with you. Let's, let's encourage you to, to make this work, okay? Friends are really, really important. But anyway, his friends are freaking out on him, and then God steps in. And I will tell you something. If you want to know a little bit about God, go to Job tonight, 38, I think it is, to 41. Job I mean, God comes to Job in this whirlwind. Look at what Job 38.1 says. Then the Lord, jo the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I am going to ask you, and you instruct me. In other words, Job, why, are you, why is anyone asking the why question? Do you not know who I am? Well, let me tell you, Job, and I want you to ask, answer these questions. So he rails at him for four chapters. And here's some of his questions. Job, where were you? Where were you when I made the earth? And where were you when I made the ocean stop like the waves stop right here to where they didn't go inland? And Job, where were you when I made like the constellations and the stars? And, 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 and have you ever seen a hippopotamus or a crocodile? Or do you know how the eagle gets his food? Like Job, where were you? And he goes on and on and on and asks these questions. And by the time he's done, this is what Job says, I'm not even going to ask why anymore, okay? Sorry I even, even thought that, okay? Because now Job gets to see God for who he is. God says, this world is mine. I do what I, I, I need to do. I'm here to save people. And if that means you have to lose 10 kids and you have to lose all your possessions and Kristen has to be in the hospital, and, and it saves, God's on a save the world mission, okay? And we are going to be part of it, but sometimes he lets us suffer to do that. And I can't make that better, okay? But I, I can get us to start thinking of it properly. Um, we're not going to have time to do any of this. We need to change our perspective on the world. If you go down to Hebrews 13, um, 4, here's what it says. For this world is not our permanent home. 1 Peter 2.11 says, uh, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. Philippians 3.20, we are citizens of heaven, okay? We have to change our perspective on this world. We think that this world is all about what's here and now and our children and our jobs and, and having grandchildren and making money and watching sports, and that's what it's all about. And God says, no, no, it's not. There's a dying world that needs Jesus, and we're here to save people. And I am going to use you and I in the situations that I put you in, and God says, I'm God. I can do anything I want. You can either get on the God train with me or, or you can get derailed. And I don't want any of us to get derailed. And that's why I'm not big. I don't get the suffering thing. But I know that someday I may have to suffer like Job did. I pray to God that never happens. I don't want that kind of life, okay? But it's kind of like we have to look at our trials and our tribulations with eternity in mind and get a whole new perspective. And when we do, we can make it through. I was reading a book the other day. I don't know what time it is, but I have a feeling it's getting kind of bad time. <sighs> Five minutes, okay. I was reading a book the other day. It's called A Grace Disguise. It's by Jerry Sitzer. Uh, he, has, um, he had a wife and four children, and his wife homeschooled the kids. He ended up uh, coming home. His mom, his mom decided to come home that weekend. They decided to go on a big field trip. They went on this field trip together, four kids, mom, him, his wife. They went up, they drove back late at night. A drunk driver crossed the roads, had hit on, head on with them, killed his wife, his mother, and his four-year-old daughter, okay? Left him a single dad of three young kids, okay? Now, that is horrifying, but I will tell you what he's done. He didn't run away. He didn't sit around and say, God, why would you do this to me? He took his story, and he's written book after book after book to help people that have gone through trials, that devastating losses like that, okay? He didn't walk away from his faith, and that's what I think we need to learn from today is that you've got him. You've got Johnny Erickson Tata. You know, she's, she's a, a paraplegic from the neck down, okay, or whatever it is, quad, I don't know what that is called, paralyzed, okay? And, and, and she still loves Jesus, and she's got to be, what, almost 60 years old now? She's just waiting for that day when she dies so she can get a new body.
okay, and she's not paralyzed anymore. She can walk away from her faith. Saeed, I look at him in prison, he hasn't walked away from his faith. He's doing everything he can to share Jesus with every Muslim. It may cost him his life, but see, his, his perspective is my life is not about this earth. My life is about my eternal home. And if we can get that, it literally will change our life. Uh, at the end of the story, Job gets everything back and, and, and more, which is kind of weird because I, I was telling someone this morning, if I lost my 10 kids and God gave me 10 more, I, I don't know that I would, it, it just still would make me sad. I'd still miss my original 10 kids, you know what I mean? But what it showed me is that God gives us the grace that we need. He just does. And I've never had to suffer like that, but if I do, I know I'll get through it. And I know he'll give me everything I need to, to make it past um, the heartache. And, and he'll let me forget the future, forget the past. And he'll give me hope for the future because I'll focus my eyes on, on him. So that's how we want to end today. Look at the psalm says in, in Psalms 1830. He says, as for God, his way is perfect. And when you have a problem in your life and you say, I don't think God is perfect because of what he's just done in my life. Then we have to go to the next verse in Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts with your thoughts. See, how we respond to suffering is what is going to bring people to Jesus. And that's our mission in life, to know him and to make him known. And that's why I don't want us to get discouraged. I want us to say, you know what? I want to suffer well when it's time to suffer, and I want to honor God, and I want to point people to Jesus, and that's my prayer for all of us. God, I pray that you will help us today as we look at the life of Job. God, our lives are yours. As a follower of Jesus, we have given our life to you to, to let you do anything you want with us so that we can in turn make your name known. God, I just pray that every one of us in here will change our perspective and make us see this world is not about this world. It's about you saving as many people as you can. God, use us in whatever situation in order to do that. Thank you, God, for, for giving Job the grace. I pray for those that are dealing with suffering beyond anything I can imagine and give them all the grace they need to make it through. Help them never, ever to walk away, but to turn to you and just let you envelop them in your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe you're going to struggle every single day of your life um, with the situation that you have. Uh, maybe you wouldn't yell at your kids, but do you gossip to all the girls? Okay. Maybe you wouldn't wear those things. But it's so true. It's like, what do people say about Christians? You're so judgmental. As we progress in our relationship with Christ, our lives will change. And now, instead of judging when you believe the Bible and the Bible alone, I said, that's what we live for is just this one